so I did. So, so I ate it. <laughs> uh, it was, well, I mean, that's where FDR got it wrong, though. I mean, that's why we're in the in the situation we're in. So you that look at this guy. He thinks he can do better than Dale. Hand me the game. Hand me the game there. You're always freaking out about this kind of stuff. All right, all right, fine, fine. Here, here you go. Thank you. Yeah, let's see if you can do okay. anything. All right, we'll, let's go. We'll, we'll play. We'll, come fine. on, we'll, we'll go through history, history again one more time, and we'll just see how you do. Criminy. The Flow of History, designed by Jesse Lee, is a civilization building game in which players not only produce a tableau of cards in front of them to just build their civilization and their empire over the course of a number of ages, but it's a game about global market manipulation. On a player's turn, they can do one of a number of actions. They can invest in a card by placing their marker on the specific card they'd like and putting any number of their resource tokens on that card. However, by declaring this intention, you have to wait for your turn to come back around because it takes a second action to claim your investment. As long as you leave your marker on a card, you're leaving yourself open to the possibility of being sniped, which is another action you can take. When you successfully claim a card that you've invested in, you add it to your civilization and take a bonus depending on how you've built your world. Right, sniping. If you're impatient or mean or both, you can simply pay someone their investment money back and immediately steal their invested card. Sure, you have to pay them, and then they also get a bonus for trade, but you get that shiny new frigate you didn't really need, but you wanted in order to flex your military muscle. Oh, wait, did you even want that? Did they even need that? Some players build up a sieve that earns big bonuses for having people snipe them, which is really great because it adds a whole other level to the strategy of just taking what you need. As the game progresses, different tactics and styles will emerge, not only out of planning, but out of reaction, and out of pure necessity. Some cards have actions that can be activated on a turn, which adds all that much more intrigue into the mix. And finally, the last action you can take allows you to put money into the global economy and take some for yourself. And that brings me to one of the most interesting bits about this game. The economy starts off pretty closed. Everyone has a limited number of resource tokens, and that's the money in the game. Sure, there's a whole pile of resource tokens outside the game, but they have to be brought into the game by either separate cards or actions by each specific player. And in that way, the game starts out pretty sparse in terms of the types of money that's in the game. As history moves forward, there's more and more resources in the game, which is incredibly thematic and also adds an interesting level of strategy. As cards are taken from the market, the deck slowly dwindles in the ages advance. Rather than every card always being a part of your civilization, only the bottom icons remain. For each new card that a player takes, they must cover up the top portion of that card type, making a sort of cascading historical document to show where they've been and how their ancestors survived in a bygone age with technology that they could really use right now. But, you know, it would be silly going back to using samurai even though those extra fighting icons could come in handy. And those icons at the bottom of the card, those are the bread and butter of the game. Not only do they offer advantages and bonuses throughout the course of the game in order for you to get more resources, they're literally the victory points. Each icon, with the exception of the culture icon, acts as half a victory point, with the culture icon acting as a full victory point. You want to have a rich and diverse culture and history so that you can not only thrive against your opponents, but then when the future rolls around, you can be the one that, to say, we are the most advanced, we're the most sophisticated, we're the best country in the entire world. And so what could have been a cute little card game is a real brain-burning thinking game. A game that takes a lot of interesting ideas, ideas that I wrestled with when going through the rulebook just because they were so different from what I was expecting. I think one reason I wrestled with some of the concepts in this game is the rulebook wasn't completely clear. Uh, reading it all brought everything together, but honestly, any rulebook that has set up on page 10 uh, has room for improvement. And because of that rulebook and because of some of the concepts, the flow of history has that sort of initial learning curve, but it's a curve that's well worth taking 10 minutes to figure out because it's got a familiar concept, the concept of simply taking cards and putting them in front of you to build your civilization. A really fun and interesting idea, especially if you've not been introduced to this genre of games. It bypasses some of the super simple mechanics that we've seen in the past and introduces more complex strategy that each individual player can tailor to their specific play mode. Now, it's possible for me to gripe at the fact that every card comes up throughout the course of the game. There's going to be no difference between what cards you see the first game you play and the hundredth game you play, because every deck is exactly the same. There's no variation. And that brings up two points. The first point is that things can get stale. 
if you need that variation, if you have to have differences in every single game you play, this is not going to be something that will interest you. It'll be a major turn off for you. Point number two is it allows for a greater exploration of strategy. You know that communism is going to come up. And you know that all it takes is one single coin to be invested in that when all of the world economy is thrown into chaos. So that's something you know what cards are going to come up and you know how to plan for them, but you don't know how they're going to interact with each specific game. So we know what happened in the past. And you're going to know what happens in this game. But how are you going to piece it into your civilization? And that's the question that the flow of history asks. I want to point out as well that there is a two-player variant to this, which is huge. It's not nearly as compelling as a higher player count game, but it is good. Using a dummy player in a completely different way than I've seen in other games, you have this banker token that is used by each individual player, not necessarily as a third player, but just as a way to screw with the global economy. You're removing cards from the game, you're manipulating the economy, and you're hurting the other player in the hopes of helping yourself. And it works well. And as far as we know, the history of the world is fixed. It's not changing. Similarly, in this game, the history hasn't changed and won't, at least until there's an expansion. In the meantime, I love that the flow of history gives you all these awesome historical events, people, and wonders, and lets you build what you want to build.